ladies and gentlemen. I would like to warmly greet you again at the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk. In Gdańsk, which on the historical map of the 20th century is a special place. Because it was here where the shots fired at Westerplatte on the 1st of September 1939 started the Second World War, the most tragic term conflict in the history of the whole human civilization on the European continent. The war broke out as a result of an agreement between two totalitarianisms, the Soviet communism and German Nazism. And although the former laws in 1945, it was the Soviet communists that influenced people's life in this part of Europe for a few decades. It wasn't until the 1980s, also in Gdańsk, 500 meters from here at the Gdańsk shipyard, that the process of the communist system's collapse began. It was where in August 1980, the independent self-governing labor union solidarity was born. A movement aimed at everybody rather than against anyone. For this reason, I'm really pleased that representatives of equally important, exceptional and symbolic places of memory have arrived today in the city symbol. We have met here to discuss how to effectively preserve or develop for the purposes of memory sites of numerous important battles, but also to ask ourselves a number of questions about constructing and taking care of forms of memory based on the values which spring from the history of the battlefields themselves. We have tried to, of course, quite subjectively close the intentions of the World's Battlefield Museums Forum in the logo presented here. We have showed armed soldiers from three distant historical periods against the background of the shield. To the right, a heavily armored infantryman with a spear and shield, a hoplite from the Battle of Marathon. In the middle, an 18th century soldier fighting for independence of the United States. Finally, to the left, a soldier from Westerplatte, the symbol of Paul's struggle, defense, independence. What do they tell us, ladies and gentlemen? First of all, they indicate the horrifying and at the same time unchanging centuries old tradition of armed conflicts. They started at the beginning of civilization, continued in the ancient period, 20th century, and as we know, unfortunately, in the 21st century too. Soldiers have different clothes, different equipment and weapons, but they make the same sacrifice in the fight for the freedom, for their sacred cause. They talk about the war, which is a scary aspect of human history, but also about the fact that there are values worth fighting for and that should be fought for. Sometimes, unfortunately, with weapons in one's hand. Irrespective of the historical period, awareness, worldview, irrespective of the gravity of the threat and process of the fight success, which are difficult, to predict, all three of them fulfill an obligation towards a given community of values. Fulfilling that obligation, then they often die prematurely. As was written by Georges Duhamel in Lives of Martyrs, in this case about those who perish at Verdun. This cemetery is not the place of eternal rest of the old age and illness. It is a cemetery full of young and powerful men. Fortunately, over the water's horizon, for me it will be horizon of Baltic Sea, for you it may be that of the Pacific Ocean, so China Sea or Black Sea, the sun starts to rise. On one hand, the sun is the symbol of infinity. We can see that wars were, are, and likely will be waged. I hope 
however, that never again after a century of the two totalitarianisms our museum talks about, will we come back to the worship of war which Friedrich Nietzsche wrote about, unwittingly providing philosophical foundations for German Nazism. Our sun, however, is the symbol of wisdom, truth, and reason. It tells us how to teach about history, about places where two opposite value systems clashed in order to prevent armed conflicts. The rising sun sheds here the light of truth on battlefields, illuminates soldiers' sacrifice, leads them again to the pantheon of fame, and becomes a symbol of hope. You may think naive hope that their sacrifice will teach us how to discuss wars like today, but live in peace. Let me close the theme of the sun with a fragment of a poem written by one of the most eminent Polish poets, Jan Kochanowski. I hope I will not embarrass you in connection with the resonant, beautiful Polish language, because in Polish, it sounds as follows. Nie porzucaj nadzieje, jako ci się kolwiek dzieje, bo nie już słońce ostatnie zachodzi, a po złej chwili piękny dzień przychodzi. Ladies and gentlemen, it's neither the time nor the place to delve into the theory of memory as a concept. To remember simply means to be able to assimilate and reconstruct. Memory tries to preserve the past in service of the present and future. It's worth pointing out broadly that the basic structure of memory, which refers directly to history, can be divided into individual and collective memory. In our everyday work, we are naturally preoccupied with the category of collective memory. In our everyday work, we are preoccupied with the category of collective memory, as I said, and shaping it on the basis of the circumstances arising out of the history written on battlefields. French historian Pierre Nora has defined collective memory as what remains of the past in the life reality of groups, or what these groups make of the past. We will be mainly interested in this area, but we will not confine ourselves only to the discussion about important stories, scientific research, archaeology, and reconstruction. We will also devote time to the problem of commercialization of memory, its ethical and mechanical, financial and business capabilities. After all, we are not only custodians of memory and take care of state or state private institutions of culture and museums, but we also take care of individual companies which operate in the market reality. After all, and according to Peter Drucker, the theory and practice of management directly says that if a business enterprise is an organ of society, then its purpose must lie in society itself, and that there is only one valid definition of business purpose, to create a customer. Drucker says that markets are, are not created by God, nature, or economic forces, but by businessmen. Although we don't manufacture anything, but marketing plays a specific role in our everyday activity. We sell tickets, products, gadgets, and memory. Our customer has been created by history itself. The battle dust, spilled blood, thousands of bodies. We can't add anything to or deduct anything from what businessmen will call the product. But the point of the complex task is the fact that we also have to skillfully coordinate the technical operations of our institutions. To coordinate them in such a way as to stay profitable, but not to disturb the gravity of memory, the sacrum. Memory constitutes one of the basic components of the national identity. However, as Jacques Lecoff wrote, 
collective memory goes beyond the limits of history as science and as a public cult. It constitutes part of an important stake in the game of societies, in the game of dominating and dominated classes, as they fight for power or for life, for survival or advancement. The American philosopher William James wrote, and Polish historian Piotr Kostyło translated and provided a commentary that what appeals most strongly to human consciousness is heroic fight with adversities in the name of lofty ideals. James wrote, once we confine ourselves only to consuming fruit of victory, things become mediocre. Costillo concluded, we need long-term objectives, risk as well as determination, mystery, and metaphysics. Another American philosopher, Isaiah Berlin, asked directly, we have changed liberty in the negative sense, but do we know what it's supposed to look like in the positive sense? Moving from White's words directly to the practice of, of the 21st century and our tasks as custodians of places of memory, we have, I hope, no doubts that articles aimed at the general public as well as state-of-the-art and high-tech museums shape the national and international consciousness to a bigger extent than historiography, which although being the core of breakthrough observations, for various reasons, doesn't constitute the optimal means of communication with the public within a given country, and is even less effective for communication with the international environment. And I'm saying this as a historian. Ladies and gentlemen, it's good news for us as it means that we have influence on the phenomenon of collective memory. And at the same time, bad news, as the responsibility for telling the story is the best possible way rests with us. We must not become the 21st century embodiment of Max Stirner's ego, the ego which is egocentric, subjective, and demonstrates climbing attitude towards the whole world. And at the same time, all of us together and each of us individually must, as we try to do at this forum, tell the story of our nation, our sacred place which we look after, which is why we have gathered here. However, the freedom we enjoy while telling the story is more demanding. What is required in order to manage it in terms of memory is increased effort, research, courage, ability to keep the identity of the place and respect for those we talk to. It requires a lot of interdisciplinary research and fact gathering because what is supposed to become our point of reference and analysis is a structural course of facts rather than an outline of impressions. It's also worth reminding the public of armed conflicts of the past in order to draw constructive conclusions so that the terror of war can serve as a warning, make us more alert to dangers resulting in imperialist wars, civil wars, or religious ones. The memory of battles should serve as a shocking warning for the following generations, as history which has been misunderstood or forgotten will come back and happen again. At the same time, all of us are aware of the fact that there are two approaches to history. There is a critical academic history to which only a narrow group of specialists have access, and as equally true one, presented to more general audience. The latter, i.e. the historical narration in the non-scientific discourse, in particular in the form of exhibitions, is similar to looking through a photo album. Photos show only a fragment of the past reality. They come close to the objectivism of the past, but are unable to present all of it. All photos records facts. 
although they re reflect true, we spend more time looking at some of them, whereas in the case of others, we abandon them faster. A photo album will tell us about true events, but will not tell us the story of our whole life. Similarly, nobody is able to tell the story of the places from which you have come from during 30 minutes or three, five, and even 10 hours speech. Consequently, today we are facing the question which you must have answered at your institutions a long time ago. And today we can exchange experiences. How to talk about history in such a way as to keep it attractive to your nation, but also to the public all over the world, to ensure your museums are economically viable, profitable, and at the same time don't have to face the problem of commercialization of the national sanctity. I'm using the word sanctity on purpose because I believe the places you represent, in our case Westerplatte, are our sanctum sanctorum. Although the place is available to everybody, it's sacred as a symbol of values important to the whole nation. These places are part of your national canon of historical tradition. For this reason, a battlefield is primarily a place of memory, worship, research, interest, a center of numerous observations, but also a place where the past is reconstructed. And finally, with respect to a relatively new concept in the field of archaeology of the present, a place of exploration of historical objects, source of collections which talk about the past, a mine of relics. But also, as I mentioned in the beginning, the place of commercial activities, whether we like it or not, keeps building memory. Undoubtedly, our first and basic task is to take care of the identity of the battlefield and the remains on the battlefield itself, as we as to preserve them. Not until this main task has been completed can we think about the battlefield and the museum located nearby as a place attractive from both a tourist and historical point of view. It may seem shocking to you, as Mr. Governor said, but at this place, not certainly this, but at Westerplatte, which symbolizes the outbreak of the Second World War in all Europe, after nearly 80 years, we still cope with the basic task of preserving the legacy of the past. I would like to refer to your experience in this respect and as early as today ask you how you do it in your countries. At Westerplatte, the area of the former military transit storage requires, after years of negligence and improper treatment, a new approach and the right design corresponding to the reputation of the place. We want to present our story in the historical context, but using modern forms of communication. Let's see the short film. There are places where time flows at its own pace. Places where history is still vivid, where past events blend with those of the present. Places that look beyond time and where we hear echoes of the past. Such is Westerplatte. On September 1st, 1939, the Second World War began on Westerplatte. Westerplatte became the scene of momentous events. About 200 Polish soldiers, following their duty to fight the enemy, held out for seven days, defending this tiny piece of Polish soil. Today, those moments seem distant to us, but at Westerplatte, they come alive. Because places such as Westerplatte can tell stories that still ignite imagination. Listen to the wind on Westerplatte and you will hear the echoes of the explosions and the calls of the soldiers. 
The ruins still remember the firing rifles, the screams of the dying. Even today, the memories of those dramatic events come flooding back. The map of Westerplatte, often called the Polish Thermopylae, has not changed much over the years. Sadly, today, Westerplatte's poor condition does not give justice to its dramatic history. During the battle, only a few buildings were entirely destroyed. When the fighting ceased, Polish prisoners, under the supervision of German soldiers, dismantled most of the depot's buildings. The post-war communist authorities continued the work of destruction. Westerplatte was gradually deteriorating and over the years has changed beyond recognition. The breakthrough moment came when archaeological research started in 2016, the first comprehensive research in the post-war history of Westerplatte. The unique artifacts that have been unearthed are a tangible trace of the past, a missing piece of the puzzle in Westerplatte's history. At the Museum of the Second World War in Gdańsk, we understand that history is more than just a tale of yore. So we've come up with a comprehensive plan to renovate the relics of the depot. A plan that will restore dignity to Westerplatte, as was the wish of the surviving defenders. We also understand that glorious history must look into the future and speak to all generations, time and again. By restoring the historical tissue of the depot, we will be able to relive its history yet again. Westerplatte still has a lot to tell. The new arrangement of the former depot's area should merge the historical narrative with the needs of the modern tourist. If history is to teach, it should reach out to those who want to hear it. The Westerplatte battlefield is a landmark of international importance, and the vision of its future must meet the strict criteria of an outdoor museum. Plans include extensive changes and certain renovation activities, reconstruction of selected historical objects, conservation activities all across Westerplatte, creation of modern exhibition, cultural, and education spaces, reconstruction and replanning of the depot's historical pathway layout, and finally, building infrastructure that would meet modern standards. We wish to breathe a new spirit into the historical framework. Places like Westerplatte need a vision for the future. History will always speak out loud, but it is up to us whether we heed its voice. Learn more about the past, the present, and the future of Westerplatte. Ladies and gentlemen, on the other hand, an argument of those who oppose any reconstruction at battlefields is quite often used in the public debate. The main argument is the provision of the Venice Charter. Consequently, a question arises. Can we reconstruct on a battlefield buildings which weren't damaged during history fight, which have never become relics of an armed clash, but have become ruins post factum as a result of other actions which weren't connected with that particular story? or what may become an alternative to those places is designer new architectural forms which are often distanced from the story about the place's history. The question remains unanswered. At the same time, it needs to be pointed out, as has been recently mentioned at the conference about archaeology of the past, that archaeology of armed conflicts is quite a flourishing, although a relatively new subdiscipline of archaeology. It covers the period between the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest and the Battle of Little Bighorn. Interest, interestingly, both battles were the clash between, to put it broadly, a high civilization and a civilization which was apparently less advanced. And in both cases, the more advanced one were defeated. For many years, a group of specialists from various fields have been interested in battlefields, and for at least a few years, the scientific debate about them has also been conducted as part of a series of international conferences, fields of conflicts. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in this context, our forum is supposed to be not just another version of a scientific conference, but a contemporary agora, a forum for exchange of thoughts, observations, and experience of institutions which have a lot in common. And I hope that after this forum, these days, they will have even more shared plans and uh, observations. To confirm it, let me mention that all of our guests today have come from places which are historical milestones and indicate the beginning of great conflicts where turning points in them or are important for the history of individual nations. All of them are living testimony to the past and all of them led to the death of the soldiers who took part in them. So they are also the space of memory about the fallen and show the cruelty of war, which is such a disgrace to humankind. However, they were battles which didn't result only from the craving for power, conquest and annexation of land, but also an attempt to protect positive values, as I said the first sentences. Ladies and gentlemen, what we also have in common, and I'm saying this as a representative of the nation which has the great pleasure to entertain you, is Paul's participation in the battles whose museums and battlefields you represent, as well as participation of your compatriots in Polish armed struggle. In fact, I don't know anything about Paul's participation one hand in the battle of Marathon or on the other hand in the battle on the Marco Polo Bridge. After all, Wamping Fortress, where the war between Japan and China started in July 1937, perfectly demonstrated the phenomenon of, I don't want to say sacralization, but certainly elevation of ordinary provincial corners of the world to the role of places symbols, which all of us will discuss today. As Rana Mitter wrote in one of his books about the Asian war front, Van Ping does not look like the sort of place where the destinies of nations are decided. Even today, it is unremarkable village about 15 kilometers southwest of Beijing. Back in 1937, it was practically countryside. Doesn't this, with just a few exceptions, refer to all our battlefields? Coming back to the shared experience, I'm sure that one of the leaders of Husit, I'm not sure because we were talking about this yesterday, but I'm quite sure that the, one of the leaders of Husit battles, Jan Zizka, took part in the battle of Grunwald, which is so important for us, for Poles. The Polish involvement in the Battle of Berestechko is all too obvious. Poles' participation in the Napoleonic epic, which came to the end at Waterloo, is generally well known. What is less known, but very suggestive in the context of today's conference, is the words of Arthur Wellesley, better known as a Duke of Wellington, who, shocked by the sight of a battlefield, said, Nothing except a battle lost can be half so melancholy as a battle won. General Włodzimierz Bonaventura Krzyżanowski fought at Gettysburg. The defenders of the Shipka Pass included numerous Poles from the territory of the Russian partitions. Poles also fought at the Dardanelles during the Battle of Gallipoli, unfortunately on the both sides of the front line. One of the Poles fighting at Gallipoli, Włodzimierz Steyer, was in charge of defense of nearby city of hell against Germans in September 1939, when the Second World War broke out. The Battle of Verdum, the symbol of the First World War, in 1920 was awarded by the Marshal of Poland, Józef Piłsudski, silver medal of the Virtut Virtuti Militari, the highest Polish military decoration. A few hundred Poles fought in the Slovak national uprising on the insurgent site. And finally, there are many beautiful stories which connected the Polish and American nations during the Second World War. One million American troops who took part in the conflict had Polish roots, Polish origins. 
Among them, there were those who started the war adventure at Pearl Harbor and unfortunately finished it there. All of the stories from all over the world, battlefields, the relics, innocent victims and perpetrators need to be commemorated in the best possible way. However, for different reason. Because the one who doesn't know history is doomed to repeat it. The numerous narrations which will soon be presented from this rostrum, started by me with the Polish narration, will not change the truth, but all of us have the same objective, to preserve memory. I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much.